Okay, so let's get into our talk today, telling the story. So first of all, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, Dr. Karina Redden. Um, Karina works as a solution architect for Salesforce Tableau. After 17 years of teaching public and private K-12 schools as an art educator, she shifted into the world of data analytics. Data visualization combined her talents as an art-based thinker with her passion for research and data. She joined Tableau in 2018 as a trainer and quickly moved into a consulting role, helping organizations to see and understand their data with simple interactive visuals. When she is not building dashboard, she enjoyed running outdoors and biking with her three sons and partner in Atlanta, Georgia. So with that, I will hand over the stage to Karina. Hello. Thank Christina. you so much, Celine. <laughs> Let me get me myself set up here. Uh, share. All right, just want to say um, thank you to Celine and Ha and Jung for um, organizing this and inviting me to speak. Uh, I was very honored and surprised and um, got some input from a lot of my colleagues about things I could share in, in this 40 minutes. So, um, so first of all, as I'm kind of doing some intros, um, again, my name is Corinna Redette. I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia, so I am in the south part of the states. Um, but I told uh, Celine and Ha and Jung when we were prepping uh, the last time I was in Vancouver, I was actually speaking at an art education conference. So I feel like I'm full circle back to Vancouver, but now talking about data. So even though I'm not there uh, in person, I, I love the city and can't wait to um, continue to help in the upcoming years. So uh, this presentation, I'm going to try to make it slightly interactive. So if you have your cell phone next to you, or if you happen to have another browser screen, um, if you go to pullev.com slash, and then my name, Karina, K-A-R-I, NNA850. Um, it will open up some polls. Right now, it may not have anything there yet or until I activate it. Um, but that'll just be a way for us to kind of interact a little bit uh, during the presentation. So I'll give you a minute to set that up if you'd like to be interactive. All right, so a little bit about um, me. So yes, I do have a PhD. It's in uh, the field of art education. Uh, that's where I started my career um, way back in the year 2002. So I started teaching. Um, and my focus in my dissertation was on how the arts teach empathy. And as I was writing that, um, my older brother actually, who was attending the session today, uh, came home from a Tableau conference and was like, I've got to show you these dashboards. It's so exciting. And, and I was writing my dissertation at the time and trying to make data come alive, you know, in a very structured way with a dissertation. So he showed me this dashboard and I got excited about it. I was like, this is intriguing. This is interesting. This shows the data in a totally different way. And so that's what kind of got me um, thinking about one, other careers I could do outside of education later on, and two, just how we in general um, communicate data, share that story, um, and how there's always people behind those stories, right? We, we tend to think of data as isolated, but really there are, there's always people involved in, in that process. So, hi, Karina. Uh -huh. Sorry, I have to cut you a bit. So we try to join your Paul F link, but we cannot. So maybe you can show us the link again. Oh, sure. Uh, actually, I have it in my other screen, so I'll just bring it over. So it looks like this, pollf.com slash Karina ah. R.850. Yeah. Okay, Karina R. Cool. Thank you so much. Oh, there's an R. Yeah, I might have forgot the R. Sorry about that. <laughs> we'll, we'll get that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks for checking on that. Um, so yeah, so fast forward a couple of years, I was looking at you know ways to kind of just uh, move my career along and there was an opening to become a trainer. So I started with Tableau as a trainer. So I was in the classroom teaching people how to use the product. Um, and that got me really, you know, listening to customers, listening to 
wide range of people. Um, luckily, as a trainer, I got to teach people in healthcare, in business, in education. Um, so I really got to see how people were, one, collecting data and two, representing data. So I took a lot of that time to kind of start building my own skills. Um, uh, back in 2020, I shifted into this current role as a consultant. So I started working with um, different companies. Uh, mostly, I've stayed in government and education because that's just my my focus. So I've now started building dashboards and visual stories uh, for customers. And I found that everything I kind of learned and studied in um, our school as it relates to empathy and how we communicate also translated into being a consultant, right? A lot of what people do with data is listening to a problem, listening to um, alternative solutions, trying to empathize with um, people's data needs, data struggles, that type of thing. Um, which leads me to today, my current title is a solution architect, which when people hear it at first, they're like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm essentially still a consultant, but I run a smaller team of other technical um, expertise. So um, I'm sort of the lead consultant on smaller teams now. So that's really just a fancy way of saying, I have some experience doing what I'm doing and they say, hey, we're gonna put people with you. Um, my storytelling with data, that journey is still pretty new. Obviously this is just a three year career for me. So if you are somebody who's just graduating or maybe this is a new career change for you, have no fear. Everyone starts somewhere. Um, and depending on how much time you put in and again, attending things like this, surrounding yourself with a great support group and uh, people who can push you is, is a big part of that. So I'm hoping to connect with everyone today and get some more ideas on how I can even be a better storyteller with my data. And that's something I enjoy with this new position is that um, it kind of feels like it did when I was a teacher where I had, can have a, a wider influence um, on people and, and things. So that was a little bit about me. We can jump into the poll everywhere. Let's see if I can full screen this. So just wondering where people are tuning in from. Um, looks like we have people out in uh, areas of China. That's great, couple European, lots in the North Pacific Northwest. Uh, I would put my dot right here. I'm down here in the south, so in Mexico. Fantastic. All right, so I'm just curious uh, what your role is with data. So if you just want to type in whatever your title or, or maybe if you just graduated, what your degree was in, we'll just start to get kind of a collection of who's in the audience, right? So if we were in an actual audience, I'd have you raise your hand and, and take a quick poll. All right, we have somebody at Lululemon, forecast analyst, data engineer, data scientist. Someone in security. That's, that's a big thing right now, especially with people trying to reopen. So being able to tell your reopening story um, Someone's doing postdoc work. Good for you. Once I was done with that doc, I was like, mm, I'm out of here. Data scientists, data science team. All right, looks like we have a lot of data scientists, a couple managers and a data science team, sales consultant. All right. So I'm going to let this keep going. It'll probably, it actually will save the answers. I can look at it later. Solutions lead. So that's, you're kind of similar to me. They change your name and say, I'm a solution architect, but really I'm still a consultant. Oh, we have a PhD in neuroscience. Excellent. All right, I'm gonna click to the next one. So just kind of get an idea. I'm gonna be sharing a lot of Tableau visualizations. That's obviously my company. That's where I started. Um, but also curious, um, what, analytical, what analytical tool are you most familiar with? So once you type one in, you can actually tap and like upvote it. So we can just kind of see what's the most. So you can just keep tapping if someone already typed in your, your word here. So you can see this Tableau, they're not joining together, but that's okay. All right, a couple Power BI people. We, we welcome all kinds, right? I'm not against Power BI. A <laughs> couple Python, R, okay. I don't see the, 
the big E up here yet. People are laughing. I see. I, I, I see. I see Zhang smiling. She knows what the big E is. <laughs> Mode analytics, click view. Okay. Spark. A lot of tableaus out there. Welcome, Tableau affiliates. All right. And then last, just wanted to, since this is all about data storytelling, I want to just get an idea. And I want you to think about either a book that's story that's close to you. Maybe it's a movie and not everybody's a reader. Um, but think about what are the elements of a great story? Like what about a great story lingers with you? And this is going to make kind of a nice little word bubble. So we have remembering, relevance, okay, actionable. Maybe there's a purpose behind it, a good plot. Connectivity, great word. Surprise, visual, all right? We're thinking of good children's stories. We probably have very graphic pictures that we remember even as we get older, right? I'm sure everybody has an image of their favorite storybook characters. Relatable. All right, maybe an argument. Some people are looking at plots, characters. Okay. Wonderful. You guys, so the more people added words, so audience was big, actionable was big, visual was big. All right, great. So I'm going to exit out of that for a minute. So kind of on the same thread, I started looking from that perspective. I'm like, what, what do we mean by a story? What do we mean by a data story? And then what's the process in telling data stories? So for this, um, presentation, I'm going to kind of focus on four big topics. One is an idea of becoming people-centered. Two is then, if we're telling stories, how do we communicate value and or drive action? What are some visual elements that you need to tell a good data story? And then the last, I'm just going to kind of walk you through my process. So I know as, as sort of somebody new in the data world, it was always great for me to sit in on other consultant sessions or other um, you know, conferences and presentations to understand people's workflow and their process. Because while the outcome is what we're going for, like, did I create a data story? The process is just as important. All right, so we just kind of brainstormed that what makes a great story. So really, and I, and I love that some of you wrote words like connectivity, relatable, um, uh, vivid. I saw that word on there too. Really, when we're trying to tell a data story, there are still people, their experiences and their lives are at the heart of those stories. So I was put on an account right when COVID hit last year and every day was seeing those numbers come in with, with COVID cases. And on the data side, we kind of sometimes get wrapped up in just, I have to communicate this number, I have to communicate this number, realizing that that number still represented a person and a person who might be ill, a person who might be dying or have already passed, and to still be sensitive around telling those stories. Even in the fact of the colors you choose, um, the wording you use, and then making sure people feel represented, um, something as simple as having their gender identities represented in the data. So this many male gendered people have COVID, this many female gendered, this many who are choosing to remain un, ungendered or people who identify as both, or those are small things, but those are a part of those data stories as well. So you guys all mentioned some very big things of stories. And when we think about just a book story, we think of characters, right? A plot, a climax, and then perhaps something memorable that we walk away with. Very similar when we're looking at data stories, we want to start with the audience, right? So the audience can be equatable to that idea of a character. Who am I telling the story to? Who are the key people that are going to be listening to my story? We can kind of look at the plot as 
the main things you're trying to do. So what problems, maybe you're trying to reflect an issue um, and that's gonna be the meat of your, of your story, right? The data is, is behind it. That's all those juicy parts, the vivid details that come out in a plot. The climax can kind of be your, your solutions or your takeaways, right? Generally, if we're writing a data story, we have an outcome that we want to share, whether it's suggesting to fix a problem, whether it's um, offering a, a solution or just saying, here's what I found, what do we do next? Um, or here's what I didn't find. And this is an issue in our data collection and we need to fix it. And then the memorable parts, the parts we walk away with is generally down to that design. Um, something that was kind of interesting coming from the world of art. When I started in data, um, I'd be on a, a, a scoping call and somebody would be like, well, you know, it'd be nice to make it look good at the end. But really those choices you make about what's important, it's not just about making something look good. It's I'm gonna communicate it and use visual elements to communicate clearly. So I'm gonna chat just a little about my storytelling process. Um, and later we'll talk about the actual process of doing all the steps. But um, one of the resources I like to use to practice is something called uh, Makeover Monday. And it's started in our UK office. Every Monday they post a new data set, public data. And the challenge is to take an hour, maybe more, they usually recommend just an hour of your time to create a visual. So sometimes it's changing a bad visual or maybe an ineffective visual. And what I love about Makeover Monday is you can go to their website and you can see multiple visits with the exact same data. So it's a great resource if you're just looking for, well, I'm trying to get out of just the same old, same old bar charts and cross tabs. Here's some other designs to go by. So um, this was a piece that I did for Makeover Monday um, that was about, the topic was about violence against women. And when I'm talking about like that idea of who is the audience, right? So right here, it's just whoever's on Tableau Public, could be anybody. Specifically, this is a project called uh, Viz5 which um, the ultimate goal of this project is just to use data and use data visualizations to create awareness about, awareness about gender inequality around the world and to bring it to light to help start solving those problems. So that's my audience. The data was a survey that was given um, in different African, Asian and South American countries on when certain actions of women justified violence against them. So these were the actual uh, um, phrases, women deserve to be beaten if, and then there were a couple uh, um, selections you could make. And then the, the survey was what percentage of men and women responded that yes, this justifies violence. So when I was looking at what story am I telling, I really wanted to hit home with this being a graphic sort of, this sentence doesn't make sense, right? Do I agree with this sentence? Most people in, in my part of the world would say, well, of course, no, no one deserves to be beaten. Um, so the fact that anyone would reply yes is shocking. So I focused on one, just the words of the survey. I really wanted those to stand out. So as the storyteller, I decided that was the key. But then I decided that I wanted people to be able to see the responses, but see them in a quick, clear way. So this bottom part was, you know, how people responded based on their employment, their education, their age. And it becomes um, pretty interesting to see how those responses change. And there was always one that stood out where there was no education there was a much higher agreement that this was then okay. So then further down, if you wanted to drill now into the specific countries, um, they're highlighted by color. So I wanted to really kind of show where the disparities are and what countries were sort of the ones that were the biggest, um, needed the biggest change. So I wanted my end audience to click, to drill, 
to explore the data a little bit, but on a very um, simplistic way. So I wasn't trying to make it a more complex visual, um, you know, giving them an access, making them be able, able to pick, pick which one they wanted to, to drill into. And then at the bottom gave my summary. So again, my design elements, uh, when I'm thinking about that memorable takeaway, I decided to uh, privilege the text. That was kind of one of my main things. Keep the color palette simple. So just having men and women represented with two colors. Have it be a vertical read. So I wanted people to sort of scroll, build the story, right? And then build the conclusion down here so they could kind of see what my recommendation, if you will, was like, hey, overall access to education seemed to be the one that made the biggest difference. And then I even said, learn how you can help with the link below and added links below. And then in the um, uh, more detail part, you can actually click to, since I'm the author, I get to click that, but um, there was another uh, viz that I used as inspiration. So I always wanna make sure that I'm giving credit to other people who are inspiring me because you don't design in a bubble. That's just rule number one of being an artist. Uh, so I actually used this person's viz on half marathon data to help with that, okay, let's add something in the middle that we're reading and then men versus women on the sides. So that kind of leads me to this first part of, of understanding your story is making sure you've got a good toolbox and a good list of references. So a couple of my favorites, obviously I'm a Tableau person, so I'm on Tableau Public a lot. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the platform, it, it's a lot like Pinterest for Tableau users. So you can uh, like people, you can follow them, you can make a collection of your favorites. Anytime someone you follow publishes a viz or likes a viz, you kind of get um, a record of that. So it really helps to build um, what I call a digital sketchbook. So there's often times that I'm meeting with a customer about trying to, to create a visualization or tell a data story and they don't know what they want. They're like, well, we're used to seeing it this way, but can you make something new? And I found that the more you can put in front of somebody to say, well, what about this option? Here's a benefit of this chart type. Here is a style that's a little more readable then they can say, yeah, I like this, I like this. And, and you can kind of hodgepodge, you know, a design together. It's so much easier to do if you've got those resources ready to go. Um, or if you're designing for a project, I know some of you said you're in education, uh, great to have that. So I have a link to Tableau Public um, on here. Makeover Monday, as I mentioned, is a great uh, tool for veteran data people and brand new data people. It's just a nice community to tap into. Um, I also follow a couple different bloggers um, and websites. I follow the Fleurledge twins. They are kind of famous in our Tableau community, uh, Ken and Kevin Fleurledge. Uh, they do a great job of upkeeping a blog that's not only tips and tricks, but um, some best practices of data visualization. Uh, there is actually a site called Storytelling with Data. Um, who the authors with it have a couple published books. So if you're brand new to it, I would highly recommend uh, reading up on, on those publications. And then finally, if you're not on Twitter, there is a really active Twitter data family and the hashtag is hashtag data fam. Um, once I started following a couple people there, I was surprised at how wide my group of, like my network is. Um, there's someone I follow who's in um, Budapest and another person in, you know, South Africa. And you just start finding people all over. You know, your bubble doesn't have to be uh, where you live or your business. Um, and I found a lot of those people on Twitter. The next topic I had was 
after you've sort of gathered that information, you know, you're, you're starting to explore the data, maybe you've got some ideas for, for design, you have to decide what it is you're telling, why you're telling the story, right? Is it to communicate value? Is it a call to action? Um, is it a flaw that you need to highlight out of, out of something that's working well? And then I kind of look at data stories in two different categories. Am I exploring a topic or am I explaining a topic? So sometimes we think a story has to have, like I am telling you what, what I see. And that's one way to do it. There's a lot of presentation style where your job is to just highlight what's going well or highlight what needs to be fixed. That's the whole point of the data story. But there's the other option where you can make one that's a little more exploratory. You show what you found, but you also let your end user explore the data on their own and uncover their own findings, which is kind of what I was doing with the um, violence against women. I found something in that data. Um, I had a way I wanted to present it, but I wanted to also let my end audience sort of drill down and see for themselves um, what they could find. So I gave them all the numbers, right? I could have just said, education is the highest and here's all the ones that had high responses for education and I could have excluded all the other data, but I chose to put it in there to allow a little bit more uh, questioning to happen. So these are two visits um, I just kind of grabbed off of my favorites um, to have us kind of think about what it is that we're trying to do when we communicate value or drive action. So this first one is uh, Lindsay Poulter, also on Tableau Public. I'll close all these other ones. And I love this story because it's just kind of a very, very short story. Again, anything that's kind of narrative and is giving you um, solutions here. So she has a question here. How does the composition of the final four differ between men's and women's ba basketball? And then she tells you this is a look over a couple decades of tournaments. So while we're looking at this, obviously there's a lot of text to read, but she's organized it in a very clean and easy way. There's a couple colors that are coded here. Um, and she's just making some comparisons between men's and women's basketball with some narrative highlights. So again, she has a specific story here to show, but she's deciding to let us again, sort of walk through the data on our own, but then pointing out things that she has found important to compare. This other one on a little more serious topic, this is Mark Soares. Uh, this is called Invisible Walls, the Reality of Racial Segregation in America. And again, this reads a little more um, like someone who's, who's setting up a problem here at the top. And these are all ones that um, I think they're sharing our presentations later. So you'll have links to all of these. But he's sort of setting up the problem that we still have segregation in our main cities. So he's given us a very simplistic color palette. And I'll wait for this to load all the way. But then each city shows the breakdown of where these different ethnicities live in the cities. Below each map is a summary of the findings in that city. Now this is in the art world, we talk about repetition as being a visual element that can be very powerful. And I love that this is an example of repetition. So we have the same design, the same color palette. It's labeled neatly on each one and there's a summary below each one. So again, a little more exploratory story. But then at the bottom, he's also giving us definitions and then his resources. So we can kind of pull our own conclusions at the end. So with both of these two, um, Again, it's a little more open-ended what the outcomes are. Some of it is just to bring an issue to light, to say, here's, here's the problem. Um, and because these are on public, 
we are the audience to say, what do, what do we do next? How do we, what are the next steps we take? The business world, that's not always what's going to happen. It's probably a little bit more straightforward what the, what the drive action or communicate value is going to be. So this is probably one of my favorite parts. And I think the part that I get asked a lot because of my background in art, but that idea that we can utilize visual elements uh, to make our stories memorable. So in, in data uh, visualizations and design, you can use things like the color, positioning, uh, text, and even the types of charts that you choose can have a, um, a powerful impression on the story that you're trying to tell. Now, when I'm working with customers, again, I'll, I'll have a bunch of samples ready to go. I'll have something in mind that I think uh, might tell the, you know, might communicate it the best way. But again, knowing your audience is a big part of that. So if your audience is used to seeing things in bar charts and you suddenly throw out a very dynamic slope chart or Sankey chart, they're like, I don't even know how to read this. You know, so why would I quickly change the chart types? Um, if you're at a company and you're, you're trying to maybe transition them from a stagnant report that tells a data story to being something that's a little more interactive, sometimes you have to do that gradually and introduce those design elements gradually. So I found a couple um, examples that um, I'd like to share too. And these are just three big areas that I have found to be helpful in my data stories. Um, one, making sure you're choosing color to highlight values. Either they can be meaningful colors where a color represents a category. So in that uh, segregation in America, color is representing an ethnicity. So that would be a use of categorical color. When I was just showing male versus female responses, I just needed two colors, also categorical. Sometimes people use a color to highlight one value. So let's say I had a bunch of low values and suddenly I have a spike. Everything's gray except that one orange spike. You know, that's gonna be a, an example of using color to highlight um, or to point out maybe a high and a low. So my recommendation is to always start with two or three main colors. Everything else should be neutral. So by neutral, whites, grays, blacks, browns, keeping it low key and until the colors that you're trying to tell the story. Keep it simple, easy to read. Um, think about when you're telling a story, even when I'm doing this presentation, I'm giving you some pauses, right? There's nothing I hate worse than being in a presentation and someone just talks the entire time and you're like, okay, pause, let you think about what you heard. You kind of have to do that visually with data. So having visual pauses in the space, a title with a little bit of space with a chart type with a little bit of summary. You know, that segregation one again, here's an image, summary, image, summary. There's space between it. Our eyes need that visual space, just like our ears need it too. And I always think less is more. I usually draft something up and then cut it down by 50%. And the 50% is what we need to see. The last thing is balancing, sizing, and labeling. So often, um, and everybody's probably seen one of these if you've been in data at all, people over-label, over-fill. They try to get every inch of a piece of paper, every inch of a dashboard, um, and we call that cognitive overload. So if there's just so much that you can't, it's almost like noise. Like there's so much going on you can't hear. There's so much visually going on that you can't see. So trying to make sure you're using size to guide people's eye as well, large and then small, right? So here are some examples, um, all from different people I follow on Tableau Public. And Judith Becker is an amazing designer. She actually came from graphic design and now she's in data. Um, I highly recommend her blog and her uh, Tableau Public page. Um, she also does some of the Viz5 challenges. 
So in this one, she's using color to highlight um, visible women. So you can see this trend uh, in women versus men here. Uh, Kavita, also on Tableau Public, um, has a really nice way of taking something complex and giving us a very simplistic view. Um, this was a complex problem around digital uh, gender gap, and she decided to make a grid of color so that we could kind of understand a high and low and a high and low. So it's almost a mini chart inside of another chart. Excellent um, design there. And then um, Sarah Bartlett also, she runs a couple of our Tableau uh, events, uh, has a phenomenal Tableau public page. Um, this one I like, and I'm actually gonna open this one because when I'm talking about that pausing and understanding large versus small in your layout, this one is a really good example of that. Um, large titles, small, right, color, but you can even see all this white space, all this white space. You kind of don't even notice it's there because you need it, right? So she's giving us that sort of column layout, easy to read, easy to see what the sections are about. Data is labeled very clearly. There's even uh, action buttons, but we're not overwhelmed, right? She's done a really good job with that layout. Most of these on Tableau Public too, you can download. So if you ever wanted to like, oh, I wanna rebuild that thing, but use my data, you can download this workbook if you have Tableau and kind of plug and play. Always give credit. Give credit to who gave you the idea. All right, the last little thing I'm gonna chat about here in the last five minutes or so, or four minutes, um, is that, that process. So I said I would kind of chat about that process of how I created a data story. And I said, well, these stories may seem very linear, the data and the process may not be. It may be a lot of give and take, a lot of back and forth, a lot of here's a draft, oh, but now I found more data, so I'm gonna revise that. Or Someone sees the story and says, but what about this? And then you have to go and add that. So making sure you set up a process that's sustainable for you as somebody who's working with data and for whoever you're designing or creating for, um, making sure you have those good lines of communication is really important to have successful data stories. So this process is very iterative. Um, and I am working with Hawaii Department of Health and they gave permission for me to share some of the work I'm doing with them that's all public, publicly accessible data. Um, but uh, so on the flip side, I started with a different state in their COVID cases. And now with Hawaii, I get to help them with their COVID vaccines. So I love that because it's the positive side of this um, whole pandemic is getting people on the track to normal. So. Uh, right away, they, when they started collecting, when they started administering vaccines in January is when I came on the account and they were like, we don't even know what we need. Just, just give us something. So I drafted this. Um, they knew they wanted to track, you know, vaccines that had been ordered, got to the state, and then how many had actually gotten in people's arms. And for public, we wanted to utilize some elements like iconography. So people could see, oh, it's in a truck. Oh, now it's at my pharmacy. Now it's in my arm, right? Um, so this was our draft. It got us talking about what they needed to see, what was important to see. Um, and I kind of love this. So this was our very first running total of vaccines administered. This is way back in February. And now when I get to this later, um, oops, uh, this later image, the, the chart type has had to change because of the number went up so drastically so quickly. So I'll point that out in a minute. Uh, so we had a process where after requirements were met, we published internally so they could get some feedback. And then we had no 
structure around what their data look like to the public. So we created what's considered a style guide. A lot of companies have these already, you know, their company colors, fonts, things like that. Hawaii did not have one. So in the process of creating one, I kind of helped them find a style that could be sustainable um, and simple to read. So you can see this chart became this chart because we had too many little tiny lines. So now it's just an area chart to show um, increase in running total of vaccines. But you can see some of the ideas stayed. This, um, every time I draw on the screen, it's going back there, there we go. Uh, this progress towards population, we've kept that in there. We've just now shown um, first dose versus second dose. Um, so I wanna actually, Ooh, I was going to go to the website really quickly so you could see the, the current ones. It's a link to the current one. But I know this at first, we're like, how is this a story? And data stories may not always have like the, here's, here's what I'm showing you. Here's the process and here's the solution. So with this Hawaii um, vaccination dashboard, they wanted to tell the story of vaccines in Hawaii. So that idea of it's shipped, it's here, it's to the people. And now that it's to the people, what do the people need to know? So we've added um, buttons so people can see how's their county doing? How are people in their age group doing? Um, we, uh, for a while, these were getting filled in by what phase we were um, vaccinating. So it's almost letting them turn the pages of the, of the data they need to know. So in clicking on these, you can see the different um, progress based on these uh, other elements and still making it very easy for the public to interact. So keeping it simple, keeping it um, graphics that make sense from the data. You guys are gonna love that slide. <laughs> um, so the last little thing I wanna just kind of close with and then we'll um, open it up to the, the next section today. Uh, this is one of Judith, Judith Becker's, I love this viz she made. She said, this is me when I'm working in data viz and <laughs> how excited we can get and then crash and get upset and then close the project. So, um, in the, uh, in the process of storytelling, these are sort of my, my takeaways for you is that one, uh, listen with empathy, try to really figure out what it is that you're trying to communicate either to your audience, to your stakeholders, to your customers, um, what do they need, but then also what is the data sharing and what is it not sharing? Sometimes what's absent in the data is just as important as what's there. Uh, focus on whatever message it is you're trying to communicate And then once you know what that message is, use design elements to emphasize it. Use color, use design, um, use the flow of how you read it. Um, I found myself as an artist taking pictures of good advertising. Like I go into, you know, a coffee shop or a, wherever and, and look at how they were doing layouts and look at how they were advertising. And sometimes those translate very well into helping you improve your visual design skills. And then the last, it's a process. So iterate, gather feedback, build again, practice. So that was um, all I had for now. I know we'll open it up for Q&A in a little bit. But thank you so much for letting me uh, share my experience. Trina, from Enda, I see many interesting questions. So uh, just let me share my screen. So um, yeah, so the first question is, as a storyteller, one may approach the data with a hypothesis or narrative in mind. However, how should we avoid creating a biased subjective presentation in terms of the assumed narrative? All right, you, uh, I think you're muted, Karina. It's double muted. I, when I turn my mic up, it'll mute, but I'm always a little weary that it won't. So I was oh. chomping on some pretzels during the little yeah. break there. <laughs> Um, I said, that's, that's a fantastic question. So, and this uh, came up when I was doing research too, as a PhD, like you kind of go in looking for something 
or have an idea of what you're going to find and therefore you find it or you may not find it. Um, I think the best way to avoid creating a biased subjective presentation is to have other people involved in the process, right? So let's say, um, and I'm trying to think of an example from work that I can share. Um, so I was working with a company and they were using, uh, they need a dashboard to talk about um, late payments, you know, for vendors who come in and do work for them. So their hypothesis was it's department B that's getting this late and department A is doing their job. So department A gets the invoice and department B is the one we keep, that we know that they're slacking. So they kind of wanted me to make a dashboard showing that department B was the ones with all the late payments and department A was on time. Mm -hmm. And so I start building the, the data and I'm filtering where it needs to be filtered. And, and it becomes pretty clear that it's, it's not department B. It's kind of a cross between both and combinations of when something came in in a certain order, it got neglected. Mm -hmm. So I built the thing they needed to see, the solution, but in talking with other people in the process, bringing them in, do you see what I'm seeing? Do mm -hmm. you, you know, are, is there something I'm missing here? Um, am I filtering this data correctly? Am I excluding something I shouldn't be excluding? You know, having somebody to bounce that off of to make sure that you're trying to be as unbiased as you can be, but also know that some of that bias is like, if you're trying to convince somebody to make changes in an organization, yeah. for example, some of these Makeover Mondays, we're trying to convince that there's inequity. We're also trying to highlight inequity. Mm -hmm. um, so having other voices in that conversation is really important. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right, let's jump to the next question. In terms of telling a story, can you discuss the pros and cons of different modes of delivery, live presentation, dashboard, reporting, et cetera? Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm obviously very biased here. I love live presentations and interactive features oh. with Tableau. But um, I think, you know, pros to a live presentation and in Tableau, we have something called story points that mm. essentially you can make something like a, um, you know, PowerPoint or Google Slides, but it's in the, it's in the tool so that you can still click Mm -hmm. You can still drill down in the data. Let's say you're looking at high level and you can drill down to low level. Um, I love that aspect because you could, you could give your points. You could have your like, here's my point. Here's my problem. Here's my story. But then let the last slide be, let's just interact with the data. Um, and I like that because I think it invites discussion on a topic or invites discussion um, on problem solving. Whereas sometimes the stagnant report is kind of like, here's what we got. That's it. Yeah. Um, however, if it's quick things like KPIs, you know, a lot of businesses just need to see what's going well, what's not going well, then sometimes just a report is what's needed. Mm -hmm. I'm always an advocate for having a report come from live data though, because then, or, or a live, like when we make for what we're doing for vaccines for Hawaii, it's connected to live data. However, it's published stagnantly. So Mm -hmm. We can still control quality control the data and make sure, you know, nulls are being filtered or something that's incorrect can be fixed before it's published. Yeah. Would you suggest any scenarios uh, where like each of this type of uh, delivery is more suitable? Um, I would say, so dashboards are good for lots of different platforms. So let's say I'm trying to tell a story to my wide company and some people are going to be looking at on their phone and some people are going to actually be on the website or some people are going to be internal, then a dashboard can be published and viewed any of those ways. Mm -hmm. um, if it's more like we need a quarterly report that we have historically, then just having a, you know, a PDF report of a data is sometimes helpful because it's not going to change when the data changes. It's going to be from that snapshot in time. Right. Um, so that'd be an example of of having that one. Whereas, and I'm not sure what they mean by live presentation. I think just live presentation of the data. Um, I, I picture that as just you're connected to the data as you're presenting is yeah. 
like a live dashboard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say that's great if your data is changing very rapidly. So in healthcare, you may have, especially if you're in a hospital setting, the morning may look very different than the afternoon. Right. If you're looking at patient counts or, you know, even nursing shifts in and out. So in that case, you want a live, you want live data as you're presenting it because you want to be able to show those changes. Right. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, our next question. Often we are asked to create a dashboard for end users. It means that they need to analyze the data themselves. How do you tell a story when you are not there to analyze the data? Wow. Yeah. Gosh, dude, this is fantastic. We have some bright audience members here. Uh, that is hard. Um, and I've definitely been asked to create specific dashboards um, that are really just summary dashboards. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't really have a part in the analytics side. Um, I think in that regard, thinking about the flow of just understanding the data so for example, one of the dashboards I built uh, early on in my career that's still on my public that I have not updated, but <laughs> I worked at a school for kids with language processing disorders and for deaf and hard of hearing. Yeah. And they had a 26 page Word document that wow. was, <laughs> yeah, like the students mm -hmm. uh, test scores, audiology, you know, reports, and a lot of the parents, English was a second language. Yes. And this is a very text heavy word document, right? That we couldn't track changes. You couldn't see, oh, a three-year-old went from this test score to this test score because it was just a number on a piece of paper. You couldn't track, you couldn't draw a line, yes. you know, right. and say, yeah. here's yeah. their progress. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, the story is still a report, right? It's still, you think about a report card for a school. It was like that, but with medical data. And I said, well, how can we, one, just introduce what these tests are to the parents and help them understand it, what an audiology report is and does in a simple, simple way. So we took a two-page audiology report, and I just said, let's put a hearing icon and mm -hmm. a percent hearing loss and show where you know, their cochlear implant or their hearing aid is affecting that percentage of hearing. Yeah. That's all you need to see. That's right. all they need to know. Straightforward. And um, yeah, so so the first page of that report is um, icons to understand the test and the audiology. And then the second page is like, here's your child compared to typically developing kids. And here's where we want them to be. And it was on a line, you know, like here's here's a range of low, medium, high performing students. And here's your student. And that's where they line up. And that's what the parent needed to know. Mm -hmm. so, so we took this 26 page report, made it a two page document, two page interactive dashboard. Yeah, I guess it also kind of echo back to like the, 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 the one of the components that you just uh, mentioned earlier in the presentation, know your audience, because an audience here is the parents, they're probably just uh, really um, trying to uh, focus on like uh, how what type of solution that I can get, right? Like what type of, uh, what is the situation it in this uh, case? Right, so the, the story for them is not for me to analyze their child's progress. I'm just showing where it is, but I want to guide them through why is this important? Why are we printing this report for your child? How can we get your child? Because essentially they want to get them mainstreamed, you know, to regular education. So um, yeah, hope that helps answer that question for yeah. who asked. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's get jump to the next question. What is the best way to integrate statistics into data storytelling? They can often be technical, but tell us uh, where the meaning is in the data. So I've hit this a lot with Hawaii. Um, because the lead team are epidemiologists and mm -hmm. they've got a crap ton of statistics, right? And a lot of understanding what an epi curve is and understanding yeah. what, um, you know, what, why, why we're doing percent of population and what populations need to be underrepresented. So um, I know there are some tools we use to help streamline some of the statistics in Tableau. So you can integrate with like R and Python and things. Um, Again, I think summarize, like that's your job as a statistician to summarize what that stat means and either give it an analogy or give it a um, visual representation in and of itself. 
so for example, the, the viz I was showing you with the cube color code mm -hmm. um, was comparing a ratio between, I think like access to internet and access to mobile phones on a scale, which has a lot of statistics behind it, but you're just summarizing it by saying, well, your accessibility rate, and we're doing this with Hawaii with like social vulnerability, um, has a lot of different stats behind it, but ultimately what we wanna just communicate is are you low vulnerability, are you high? So she mm -hmm. was looking at low access to technology versus high yeah. um, and knowing that there's calculations behind it, but simplifying that for your end user again, like how do I, audiology report is very statistically heavy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we just get it into a couple numbers that people can understand? Right, yeah. I guess uh, this, um, yeah, the audience are probably just caring about the result instead of the complex statistic analysis, uh, statistic uh, computation. All right, next one. Please tell us a little about about your career transition from education to tech. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> it's something I get asked a lot because I did. I mean, I was I started off as a classroom teacher, so I taught visual art uh, K to five. Mm -hmm. Top middle school. Um, when I got my PhD, my my goal at the time was like, oh, I, I want to become a professor. So I really loved the research side. I loved um, helping teachers like on their journey to be teachers. So I loved teacher enablement. Um, at the time, it was just wasn't a lucrative career for me and my family. Um, I was a single mom, and being a teacher was just not cutting it anymore. Uh, it's really hard to be a teacher and um, raise two kids. And so uh, my, my older brother is in the field of tech. So was my younger brother. I'm sort of the black sheep and went the arts route. Um, and so they were very encouraging to me. Um, I actually, my, my, when I first learned about Tableau, I was kind of just loved the tool for the creativity and the visual components of it. I, um, asked, I said, well, how, how can I just learn more about this? And he said, well, we have these Tableau user groups in Atlanta and mm -hmm. they just meet at a company headquarters, you know, once a month, they kind of rotate who hosts it. Mm -hmm. And they just kind of do what we're doing here. Like, hey, here's what I'm using Tableau for. Here's, here's how I'm using it in medical. Here's how I'm using it in education. Here's how I'm using it in my business. Just to learn more, connect with people. So I attended a couple of those and just started talking with people about what they were using their data for and, um, you know, asked if I could, you know, get their information, chat with them, have a little, you know, just kind of started building my network. Yeah. And that was how I met the person who was recruiting for Tableau. And then um, transitioning to be a trainer wasn't hard because I, I had a classroom presence. I understood curriculum, scope and sequence. I just didn't know the tool yet. So they said, well, we'll teach you Tableau, but you know how to teach and you know how to yeah. talk to people and adults. And so, um, so I loved it right away. It was a new challenge for me, but I loved teaching adults and then just, mm -hmm. again, widening my bubble of understanding what is data, what is big data, how do people use data and build dashboards. And I think yeah. being a trainer, it was great because I did get my hands on a lot of little things. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped me in the position I am now. Yeah, it's really nice to bring your like a training and education background into the tech um, career as for as for today. And I also think it's a quite important for whoever like transition into another field, not just like data science, to have a, like a sense of um, that they they were able to find a community like a community and network to um, start to uh, find resources in a new field, and then maybe. Um, Fortunately, they can find a mentor who can guide them through um, the career transition. And that's why we're holding this event in the May series, hoping to help more people to navigate their careers in data science. Um, yeah, so let's see in the next question. And these types of events, anybody who's out there who's like, oh, I just don't know, this is, this is where you find people, connect with them. You know, when it's in person, you can have a chat and walk to the next, you know, event with them. and. Um, when we started doing Tableau Conference, that was really how I started connecting with other businesses too and, and finding out what they were using and what the need was. Um, and yeah, that's always growing. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Okay, so I, I think this question from Ha. I find it okay. How do you want to ask this question? Yeah. Okay. Sure. So uh, thank you so much for a lot of insight. I learned a lot today, Karina. And uh, my question is just that like I find it easier to do data storytelling when we have like a fixed set of data, a static set. But when it comes to dynamic data, like live data that is updating all the time, how can we like? I find it more challenging at times. So how, do you have any tips on how to layer data storytelling for live data? Um, yeah, so that kind of goes back to that iterative process. Uh, so with, with Hawaii, it was kind of the same thing. Like we came into a situation where, you know, vaccines are being distributed and just counting where they were was like, unbelievably hard. Like it was all these different sources, right, coming in. So we had to say, okay, how do we gather all this together and make sort of a one data source? And then as that data source, as we started sharing it, we're like, well, but now we need this. Like now we need race. Now we need race at a more specific level. Now we need age. Now we need age at a more specific level, right? So like when we started that dashboard, the first one we published was like, here's the vaccines, here's the population done. There was nothing else then it's grown and it's still growing um, because more people are touching the data, more people are asking questions. So I think um, making sure you've got a platform, and again, I'm, I'm biased at Tableau, but that you can add those links on, right? Or start with that big picture and drill down. So I know sometimes you'll have a dashboard that's like, here's the big picture. And then now I wanna see this county. So I'm gonna click on this county. It's gonna take me to another view, or maybe it's gonna take me to another visualization that's summarizing just that county. Okay, now I wanna see my city. Okay, let's click and go down. So even sort of backwards designing sometimes, like I knew we were gonna keep adding on to this Hawaii data. So the idea of having like navigation buttons at the bottom, it's like, well, we can keep people in the same view because the old, if you go to their website now, we actually, there's a lot of old dashboards that we haven't updated yet. Um, each thing is a different dashboard. So you have to keep scrolling down this long page and they just had to put it out with what they had. Now that we've got the data organized, we've got it a little more consolidated. The idea of like clicking between things or at least giving your space to, like keep building that story. So whether it's here's page one, page two, version one, version two. Um, I don't know if that's what you're asking more about the design part or incorporating the data as it's changing. It's more like a designing, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I think you have touched on a very good point. And I, I feel like it's also um, like sometimes um, executives or stakeholders come up with uh, one metrics and then they were like, oh, well, can you drill that to did and that? And then can you add more metrics? So yeah, like having a main view and then having options to let them drill down if they want to is important. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. that the dashboard I was mentioning before with the late payments um, was kind of a, a similar thing where they just wanted to see which division had the most late payments. So I gave them that view, but then you could click the division and then go and see, well, who are the people in charge of these accountants? Like, and then actually click where you could send them an email. So mm. that was the actionable step of like, well, here your, your division's been late. All right, let's see who's in charge, click. Okay, now of this person who's in charge, these three accountants are late. Well, let's send them a reminder, <laughs> you know? And so the main board stayed the same because the main leader didn't really care who, whose fault it was. They just wanted it to get fixed, you know? Right. I hope that answered your question, Hal. Yeah, that's great. Um, I guess that probably, um, as the time really getting, uh, getting close to our schedule, so probably this will be the last question. And uh, thank you very much, Karina, for <laughs> bringing all these amazing components and resources that you bring out. So this, um, very impressive visualization example to us. Well, thank um, you. Happy yeah. to. Thank you again for Karina for bringing the amazing um, content here to us, to the um, majority of Vancouver audience.